Hey guys, we're just going to give a few minutes uh, for everybody signing on. Give me an opportunity to say hello to you. So, because once I'm on the other side of the camera, I don't know who's watching. So, gives me a minute. So, hey Angie, hey Sarah, hey Tracy, hey Steve. John, are you with Steve? Oh my goodness. Gonna get, hey Miss Wilma, how are you doing? Yeah, we'll just give a few minutes, uh, see who might sign on, and we'll get started. Thank you so much for tuning in to HBC Live here on Tuesday night. Hey, Miss Vicky, how are you? Let's see here, Miss Wilma. Glad you're doing good. Miss Wilma, we all sure love you. We'll give just a few minutes, guys, while we're still getting ready to start. So, thank you, Miss Jeanette. How are you doing? How's Aunt Lois? Hope she's doing good. Chris Miller. So we're gonna wait just another minute or so and then we'll get ready to start. <clears throat> There's Carrie. Carrie, did you know that John's hanging out with Steve? We may need to get him some help. Love you too, Miss Wilma. There's Holly, one of my favoriteest cousins. It's Reba, hope you're doing well. Thank you for checking in with us. In just a few more seconds, we'll get started. <clears throat> Oh, so you do know, Carrie, you do know Steve and John are together. That's dangerous. Holly, hey girl. Hope everybody's doing good. My part of the family that lives in Alexandria, God bless them. How oh, good. Glad y'all doing good, Jeanette. All right, we're gonna get ready to start. <clears throat> All right, guys. Good to see you on Tuesday evening. Uh, glad you're doing well. Been a beautiful day. Well, I tell you, I know some of you would say, well, it's cold, but you know, um, us big people, we like cool weather. So uh, it's all right with us. But nevertheless, uh, we're grateful for the good weather and the sunshine. We kind of got on this side of the sunshine today. You may hear some noise. I think my neighbors are grinding stumps or they're tearing up a lawnmower or something because it's, it's been, uh, boy, vicious over there. So anyhow, nevertheless, they're working hard, so we pray they're okay. But thank you so much for checking in with us. As always, please feel free to share any prayer requests with us. We'd love to join you in prayer about anything that may uh, be of concern to you. So we're uh, grateful for that. We're thankful for you giving us the opportunity to work through that. Do remember, we're going to continue to do daily devotions. And uh, tomorrow night we'll be live at 6.30 for Wednesday night. And then, uh, of course, on Sunday. So keep praying for that. God's using it. God's using our ability to reach out to more people thus this way uh, and God is using it in a big way I'm talking to people every day either I see somebody or they uh, get a message or whatever and got lots of messages how God's using it to reach a lot of people we were not reaching before so thank you for that you know there's a lot of common thought that I hear going around today and I hear a lot of people say well this is really going to be uh, the death of the church. I hear people saying that, that the church will not survive, that individual churches and the church as a whole will not survive this pandemic, which I certainly disagree because, first of all, I know the church itself is not built on me or any other person. It's not built on a building or anything that we have. It's built on the Lord Jesus Christ. He taught us that in Matthew chapter 16 when he told Peter, he said, Peter, on this rock, speaking of himself, he said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I don't believe that the church is done by no means. 
I really believe that this is a great opportunity during this time for the church to be humbled and to realize that God is sovereign, He is in control, and that through this and on the other side of this, I truly believe we can see great revival if we respond right to what God is teaching us through that time. It's been my experience that difficulty is something that has always brought out the best in the church. The church has, has done the greatest throughout church history when we experience difficulty, times of less and times of uh, going through hard times. So we can see God doing that again. This wall I'm sitting on tonight is one that uh, right here by my shop. And, and uh, this morning, uh, uh, I began working on this wall because this morning this wall was black. It had, of course, years, over the years, you get uh, dirt and rain and all sorts of stuff, and you'll get some mold, and you'll get some all kind of stuff will grow on it, and uh, that's why I enjoy pressure washing, because it cleans stuff up, uh, you know, it makes a difference, and it takes something that was really black and really cleans it up, so it's about dry, and it's looking like it's supposed to, but you know, it's during the process of the water and the pressure that makes it possible for this black wall to be wide again and be clean. You know, sometimes in our life we get a little molded, we get a little <laughs> little build up on us and things of the world uh, kind of uh, begin to drag us down. Uh, you know, the Bible teaches us about that in the book of Hebrews where we're, the, we're supposed to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us or besets us. Easily ensnares us. So. We have sin that holds us back, and we have weights. Those weights sometimes can leave residue, and it can make a difference in, in, in our lives that we don't like. It can make a bad kind of difference and hold us back. So sometimes we need the pressure, and we need uh, the washing of the water that God might use it to uh, clean us to where we need to be so that we don't carry around all this stuff that's holding us back, and it's a detriment to our testimony. Y'all know if uh, one of my favorite verses, if you attend our church, you know one of my favorite verses is Proverbs 4.23. I had a wonderful seminary professor at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary at the Atlanta campus years ago, and uh, his name was Dr. Stan Wilkins. Dr. Wilkins was a dear friend of me. He loved me. He encouraged me, inspired me, and he believed in me. During a time that I'd kind of quit believing in myself, this man believed in me, and he, he helped me tremendously. Uh, in year, back in 2006, he went home to be with the Lord. And I remember being so heartbroken when he went on to be with the Lord at 53. And it just broke my heart, and I just so uh, was hurt over his death. But yet at the same time, I began to rejoice and have many times since then in what he taught me as a student. Uh, he taught us to take Proverbs 4.23 and literally write it on the tablet of our heart where the Bible says keep or guard your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life you know early on during this beginning of this pandemic I say the beginning when it became very clear that something was really going on and that schools were going to be closed businesses were going to be closed that the world was going to be altered tremendously I probably did like a lot of you. I'm as human as anybody I'm talking to. I began to try to get as much information as I could for two, three, two or three reasons. One, I wanted to take the very best care of my family I could. I, I wasn't going to panic. I wasn't going to try to hoard up stuff or anything like that. But I did want to make sure that I took care of the necessities for my family. That we had the things, the medicine and food and things that we needed to be able for me to be able to take care of them. So I watched to get information. I also wanted to know what I could do to protect not only myself and my family, but the people that I'm privileged to serve as your pastor. I mean, I mean, my heart is deeply for you and I'm very concerned about you. That's why I tell you every time in these videos, if you have a need that's not met, call me, call one of our deacons, call, do something, let us know what we can do to help you because we are here to serve you. You are our neighbor, and if our neighbor needs us, our neighbor needs us. So we're just wanting you to know that. So I watched a lot, and uh, 
I wasn't somebody that watched a whole lot of news before, so it was kind of overload. And of course, it was really, uh, you know, like drinking from a fire hose there with all that information we were getting. So during that time also, it became clear that even though I've been, quote, on social media for about 10 years, I was going to have to get more acquainted with it. I had kind of become disenchanted with it some over the years because I felt like people use it for a lot of their own reasons, and you see that a lot. I think social media is a wonderful tool that Christians can use to inform, encourage, and inspire. But it's also something that people use to complain and go on rants and fuss with people and say stuff they'd never say if they weren't behind a computer screen somewhere. So it really began to break my heart to see a lot of things I saw. I would see Christians behaving in the way they shouldn't and leaders, not I'm talking people who are leaders that were just behaving in ways that certainly was not consistent with what the Word teaches us was consistent with the life of Jesus. So I really became a little disenchanted over the past four to five years, I had truly backed off a lot from it, but this situation here, it, it, it forced me. Uh, somebody said necessity is the mother of invention, so it really forced us as a church to really begin to explore every avenue we could to continue to share the gospel and connect with our people, and it also forced me as an individual, as a Christian, as a pastor, that I would find ways to stay connected and not allow the you know, the political jargon and all that kind of stuff to cloud my mind and still stay focused on what God has for us to do. More and more that happened, you know, I began to find myself getting bogged down a little bit. And I was reminded years ago, I read this book, and if you if you are married, I don't care if you've been married 100 years, 5 years, 5 minutes, or thinking about ever being married, I would recommend you read The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. There's another book called His Needs, Her Needs by Bill Harley that I read also years ago. And both of those talk about relationships and the importance of maintaining healthy balance. And Harley talks a lot about making sure that your tank is full, your love tank is full, that you make deposits in the tank of your beloved, and your beloved makes deposits in your tank so nobody runs empty because run empty is a problem. If you don't believe me, just ask somebody that's run empty. They'll tell you. So, nevertheless, um, they talk a lot about that tank, but let me say this to you. We have several other tanks that need to be filled with the right stuff. Oh, the love tank's important in a relationship, and I would never discount the importance of that, but there's some other tanks. And I've been reading a book called Take the Day Off. I got it in my hand here by Robert Morris. I don't know Brother Morris. He He's not a Southern Baptist, but he's a pastor of a very, uh, very uh, <clears throat> faithful and, and thriving ministry uh, out west, and I have read, uh, I've watched a few of his TV shows, and I began, I saw this book in Hobby Lobby, and if you find something in Hobby Lobby, it's got to be right with God, isn't that right, lady? Y'all help me. I mean, God is all over that place. My girls think that that is where the Shekinah glory rests, right over Hobby Lobby, more so than Chick-fil-A. I mean, they, when they feel the holiest, when they have been to Chick-fil-A and they go to Hobby Lobby and hang out, look around. But I found this book when they were in Hobby Lobby being all excited and I was enduring the experience, but I found this book. So I thought, hey, it's got to be right. So it's been a, a blessing to you. take the day off. And he talks about your emotional tank. And, and I think this is really, really good because it's important to understand that your emotional tank stay full and not bombarded with all the stuff that would cause you to be aggravated and, and anxious and all that kind of stuff. See, when I was a younger pastor, and I thought about this just last night, one of my good buddies, Jeremy Holcomb, is the pastor of Emanuel Baptist Church in Tallapoosa, and I met Jeremy when he was a young teenage boy, and I baptized him and his wife Amanda, had the privilege to do their wedding, and now they've raised three children and just man just a blessing he's in his first year as a pastor and i thought oh god you know he's just getting started and boom this happens but he he's a wonderful guy he encourages me greatly god's going to use him i know that and i want to encourage him but i begin to think about these guys that are in their first and second third years of pastoring and, you know i feel like one of the old heads now but nevertheless I'm learning stuff still, and there's some things I learned in those early days that I really try to share with these guys and help them. I used to be afraid to take a day off. 
because I'd worked in construction, I'd worked in different uh, businesses, stuff like that, where everything was about getting certain amount done each day in order to get to the next day, and I really kind of task oriented. But I had to realize something about ministry. Ministry is not just about being task oriented because it never stops. But see, when you're task oriented, you get done with a task, you clock out, you don't come back, think about it till the next day till you have to. Ministry is always there. So I never took time off and I was always afraid because I would think people would think I wasn't working hard enough. Well, I can remember one instance in particular when I, my first full time church and I was a young pastor in my late 20s. And, and I had stopped by the pastorium to get a banana sandwich for lunch. And I remember during that time, the phone rang and I answered the phone and the person on the other end says, oh, preacher, what are you doing at home? <laughs> and, you know, to which I responded as a young pastor, oh, I'm just, just running by here getting a sandwich and gonna hurry right back to it, you know, go right back out on the field serving Jesus and serving God's people. And, you know, I shouldn't have been that way, but I didn't know anything. I thought that was the way it was supposed to be. But what happened was, is I didn't guard my mental and my emotional tank, and it got drained. It got drained really fast, and that's a dangerous thing. See, we've got to guard not one, only what fills our emotional tank, but what drains it. Uh, I, I remember hearing a coach say one time years ago, be a fountain, not a drain. A fountain adds to, a drain takes away. But we need to be careful because this pandemic of coronavirus it's an emotional drainer. A lot of people are pretty emotionally wiped out right now. And I fully understand because I'm right there with you. I really have to focus. See, it's important we understand that. One of the biggest drains right now is media. And we all watch it because we want to be informed. I watch some tonight. I've watched some of the press conferences. I know they go on a long time. And it doesn't matter. But you know, then and, and there's a lot of controversy and stuff. There's a lot of different things. But here's what I've asked you to do from the beginning. Don't fuss about the people in leadership, regardless whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or don't care. Don't fuss about them. Pray for them. Can you imagine if you were having to make all those decisions? Can you imagine if you were the one expected to let the nation know what's next, when to open up, when not to open up? Well, we need to pray for the wisdom of God to be on these people. Because if we don't, I mean, we fail as a people of God by not asking God to intervene on our behalf. But watching all that, it leads to aggravation, fear, sadness. And you always have these experts, you know. I used to tell the church that I served years ago, I'd say an expert is just somebody who lives 50 miles from where you live. They don't have to know a thing about what they're talking about. They're just an expert if they don't live anywhere around you. But the truth is, we've got a lot of experts giving commentary about the economy and about the, the, uh, the virus and about all this different stuff. But here's the thing we need to take comfort in. God has the final say. God has the final say. He is ultimately in charge. And if anything's ever got my attention in my life and ministry to remind me he's in charge, if you'd ever told me that America was going to shut down, and that things were going to be closer to close and the, and the guidelines and all these barriers and stuff would be in place at our, I would have thought there's no way that can happen and the country survive. But I want you to hear me. The country can survive if we stay right and we stay focused on God because He has the final say. Let me share just a couple things right here out of this book we and I'm going to be done. I really believe we need to do, as Brother Morris says here, when we start to find our emotional tank draining, we need to focus our heart on the words of Philippians 4.8. Let me share that with you. The Bible says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate on what's true. Here's a thought I believe. We need to dwell on some good news. That's why when I talked to you, I said, man, wasn't it a pretty day? It had been easy for me to say, man, this was bad, that's bad, don't know when this is going to be fixed. But it was a pretty day. God allowed us to wake up. I heard the birds singing this morning. I talked to God first thing this morning. You know what? God really, really, really spoke into my heart. Son, everything's okay in glory. <laughs> there's no crisis here. And even though you might think there's a crisis there, it's not beyond my control.
So anyhow, let me leave you with this. Henry Blackaby said, the Christian needs to walk in peace so no matter what happens, they will be able to bear witness to a watching world. The Christian needs to walk in peace and no matter what happens, we want to be bearing witness of Jesus to a watching world. And let me say this to you, church. The world is watching. They are looking to see how we respond. Is it okay to admit you've been afraid? Sure. Is it okay to admit you've had some anxiety? Sure. Is it okay to admit that you've just been a little maybe worried? Yeah, it's okay. But what we can't do is stay there. What we've got to do is say, as the world watches, may they see me trusting, loving, and following Jesus. And if they can see that, and I'll tell you, God can do some great things with your testimony. Hey, I want you to enjoy a good Tuesday evening. The sun's about to set just over the horizon, and we're going to go in. Boy, I tell you, if there's one thing the pandemic's done, it has turned my daughters into Chef Boyardee. I mean, or maybe uh, Betty Crocker, or Sarah Lee. I don't know who's cool now. Uh, MRL, bam. I mean, it is really, I mean, they have really done good. So we've got them a lot of practice. So they're getting something really good every supper, I'm sure. We're going to enjoy a meal together, which has been a blessing. Boy, I tell you, it's a blessing. Sit down with your family, talk to them. And let's look forward to tomorrow. I'll see you here again tomorrow night. 6.30, Lord willing. And just remember this. Your pastor loves you. <laughs> there ain't a thing you can do about it. God bless you. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow night.